Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. This is an ongoing series, so if you haven't seen the previous ones yet, feel free to click the little card above and catch up for some context, but otherwise, let's hop into things. Of all the dungeons in Skyward Sword, this is the one I was most looking forward to dissecting. But before we can get to all of that good stuff, the game's pacing sort of grinds to a screeching halt to make us run errands. There's a lot to do before we can make it to the dungeon, and it's a mixed bag between mind-numbing fetch questing and fun challenges. So let's recap this as quickly as we can. Per Impa's instructions, we need to return to the sealed grounds to talk to the old lady. On our way there, Groose gets the drop on us, leading to this hilarious cutscene in which he has a bit of a meltdown while coming to grips with everything that's going on. We can go inside, talk to the old lady, watch Groose have a tantrum, and learn to play the harp which Zelda gave us at the end of the last dungeon. This actually summons a second gate of time, just like the one in Laneru, but it's inactive. The old one says that we need to find three sacred flames to temper our sword before we can activate it. Just then, we get interrupted with an impromptu boss battle. Yep, our first encounter with the Imprisoned. It'll walk up this spiral path here, up towards the temple. Thankfully, he's not too difficult to defeat. You can slice his toes off to knock him down, down, then drive the ceiling spike back into his head, or you can skip the toes and just jump down directly onto his head and knock the spike back in that way. Once you've jabbed it back into his skull three times, he'll be resealed, which concludes the battle. Okay, so we have to find these three sacred flames, but first the old one tells us we have to find someone who knows information about finding those flames back on Skyloft. So we have to fly up, talk to Zelda's dad, who gives us a hint to turn these two windmills towards the plaza tower, but oh, one of them is broken and the propeller has fallen beneath the clouds. So we have to talk to this guy, get his robot fixed, find the propeller, use the robot to bring it back up, turn the windmills, play the harp up here, fly into the now open thunderhead to find this floating island, solve the rotating bridge puzzle, activate this crest, listen to some exposition from Fi, learn this new song, fly back to Faron Woods, and play the song we just learned here to unlock the Silent Realm Trial. <laughs> Yeah, we're still not at the dungeon yet. We can complete the Silent Realm, which involves collecting these little light tier things, all while unarmed and avoiding being murdered. And when done, we'll be rewarded with the Water Dragon Scale, which gives us a new swimming ability. We'll get a hint from the Kikui Elder to try exploring areas that we couldn't before, so we can enter the interior of this giant tree by swimming under here. We'll weave in and out, climbing to the top of the tree, and we'll find Yerbold, the Kikui Hermit, up here at the top. Who gives us a hint about opening the gate by Lake Floria by drawing a symbol to match this symbol here, which is the same symbol as the goddess Faror. So we do that, and then we dive into the lake, and we're still not there. Swim along the Floria River, following this Perella dude, fight some evil fish, and eventually we'll find Faron the Water Dragon. But apparently she is injured, so we have another fetch quest, which involves trekking all the way back to Skyview Temple, doing the dungeon again for some reason. Reason, though thankfully most of the doors remain unlocked from our previous visit here, but not this first one for some reason. And also getting interrupted by these magmas constantly is both unnecessary and irritating. Guys, I know how to do this dungeon, I've been here before. We can head to the very back of the dungeon, battle a trio of Stalfos, all to get Faron a bottle of water. <laughs> We can finally bring it back to her, which heals her, and she'll open for us the entrance to the dungeon. Finally. Before we actually enter the dungeon, I have a few thoughts I'd like to voice here. This section just takes too long. Even in the HD version, which is a lot more streamlined, this is still a long slog of fetch questing that is just kind of uninteresting. I actually do really enjoy the Silent Realm trial for how different it is from the rest of the game, as well as the imprisoned boss battle, but the other stuff 
is pretty egregious, especially going through Skyview Temple again. It's not like in Wind Waker, where we had to revisit the Forsaken Fortress only to be able to complete the parts of the dungeon that we couldn't before. No, we did complete the entire dungeon the first time through here, so this is just padding. If they cut out this section revisiting Skyview Temple, I genuinely believe it would be to the game's benefit. We already had to do so much just to get here, and to be just sent back to the other end of the forest to slog through a dungeon we've already completed is just irritating. The good news is that this all leads up to my personal favorite dungeon in the game. Even the dungeon entrance outside is gorgeous, with these pillars and the giant fish sculpture behind the waterfall. Though that entrance does remind me a bit of Angler's Tunnel from Link's Awakening, but it's still incredibly memorable and visually striking. Final note, you don't really have to, but you can upgrade to the Sacred Shield at this point in the game. You'll get by just fine in this dungeon without it, but it is pretty cool looking and it does have some moderate usefulness. With all that stuff out of the way, let's head into the dungeon. <laughs> The Ancient Cistern is one of the most beautifully inspired dungeons in the series. Its themes and architecture are some of the very best, and it's my personal favorite dungeon in Skyward Sword. But before we can discuss the dungeon's architecture and themes, we have to be familiar with the story behind its inspiration. And first off, what the heck is a cistern? I had never heard the word until this game, but it means a water reservoir, so this fits the bill for sure. But there's more to it than just the name. The dungeon is modeled after the famous Japanese story, The Spider's Thread. To summarize, the story tells of Buddha gazing through a lotus pond in paradise down into hell below. Among those suffering in hell, he sees a fellow named Kandata being boiled in the lake of blood. Kandata was an evil man, but had done one good deed in his life, by sparing the life of a spider. So, to offer Kandata a chance, Buddha lowers a spider's thread into hell so that Kandata may climb out. However, as he's climbing, Kandata notices many other people trying to climb out after him. Being worried that the extra weight may cause the thread to snap, he yells at them to get off the thread, stating it's meant only for him. His selfishness causes the thread to break, plunging him back down to hell. And, uh, Wow, what a story that is. To say that the dungeon is inspired by this story is an understatement. The main central room of the dungeon features this enormous Buddha statue sitting in this pool of water surrounded by lotus flowers. In fact, the symbol of the lotus flower is found all over the walls of this place as well, including the sculpture used to unlock the boss door. The upper part of the dungeon is seemingly a paradise. Golden light shines in from the skylights, and the architecture is bright and colorful. However, below Below the water in the dungeon's basement is a dark cave filled with what I believe to be pools of malice. Undead bokoblins wander aimlessly, sculptures of demons reside, and piles of bones fill rooms. The atmosphere in the dungeon's basement is a complete 180 from the paradise above. Just like in the story, this pool of water sits in the middle, separating heaven and hell. Or at least, the dungeon's representations of them. To really drive this inspiration home, a great deal of the enemies are sculptulas and walchulas, which are literally spiders, and then there is this segment in which you literally have to climb up a spider's thread out of the hellish basement and back into the bright first floor as undead bokoblins follow along after you. It's a short but tense section that is visually really awesome and genuinely gets the adrenaline going. It's great. Oh man, this dungeon just does so many things and it does them so well. It's hard to put a single theme to it. It's a water dungeon with lots of swimming, these waterways, pipes, all stuff we've seen in prior water temples. But it's more than that. It's a light themed dungeon 
and it's a shadow-themed dungeon. It explores duality, spirituality, the balance of light and dark, and it's not just the dungeon's two floors that fit this light-dark theme. Heck, even the lily pads here fit the bill. The tops of them are safe spots to rest and stand on, while the bottoms have these barbed roots, which will hurt you. The lotus flower, which grows all over the place and is painted on the walls, also fits with this theme. In Buddhism, the lotus flower is said to represent self-realization, spiritual growth, and purity of mind, as it grows with its roots in dirty, murky waters, yet blooms into a beautiful flower. And yeah, I can't think of a more fitting setting to find these flowers, in a pool above a hellish cavern. Your waters just don't get more murky than that. Now just as a disclaimer, I'm not Buddhist, nor am I an authority on the subject, this is just stuff I found in my research for this video, but I think it's really interesting, and it's implemented into the dungeon design really well. The music here comes in two forms, one for upstairs and one for the dark basement below. The first theme has such a full-bodied, ethereal quality to it. It's got this chimey bell sound that just makes me feel so at peace. I encourage you to have good headphones or speakers and just listen to this for yourselves. There's something about this calming music that also seems to have this curious, quizzical sound to it. It's not a total jam of a song like, say, the Earth Temple, but it provides the perfect ambience for this dungeon and is truthfully just a well-crafted, great piece of music. The music for the basement, on the other hand, is, well, the opposite. Rather than a full-sounding, pleasant, ethereal theme, we get this dark, distorted, hollow-sounding rendition of the song. It's not quite as high up there in the creepy factor as, say, the themes from Ocarina of Time's Shadow Temple or Icana Canyon from Majora's Mask, but the the point of this song is to stand in direct contrast to the dungeon's main theme upstairs, and it nails that. Okay, let's talk progression. There's no foyer here, so as soon as we enter the dungeon, we'll be in this large central room with the giant Buddha statue. Like all of Skyward Sword's dungeons up until now, the ancient cistern is going to heavily revolve around weaving our way in and out of this central room. And it works really well in this dungeon in particular due to just how memorable this central room is with the huge statue here. Immediately in front of us is a door to the interior of the statue, however, it is locked. Beside the door, however, However, is a stone tablet with a hint. It says that there are inscriptions which reveal the secret order of the temple. The hint says first the back, then the rear, that's the butt, <laughs> then the back of the right hand, and finally the back of the left hand. Sure enough, on the back of each hand and around the back of the statue, and yes, the rear, the butt. We'll find these inscriptions which each indicate a cardinal direction. So following the order of the inscriptions in that order that the stone tablet hinted at gives us up, down, left, then right. Remember that. Alright, so we've had a good swim around this room and seen this locked door which we can't proceed through. So we'll have to look around to see how we can make progress. If we hang a right from the dungeon entrance, we'll find this door on the eastern end of the room. There's a lever on the wall right beside it here, which unlocks the door so we can head on through. We'll enter the eastern room and find ourselves on this balcony. We can drop down and as we do, we'll land on one of these lily pads which flips upside down upon impact. This is the dungeon introducing us to this concept that we can flip the lily pads over, so remember that we can do this. Looking around this room, we'll find a water pipe, which actually launches us up to this ledge and loops us back around to the door we came through, so ignore that for now. Instead, we can head down this hall, which has two sculptures to battle. Make sure you don't get caught in the webs here. If you haven't figured it out yet, there's a very easy way to kill sculptures by swiping upwards, which flips them over, then using a fatal blow while they're overturned. Easy. Turn the corner and at the end of the hall we'll find this locked door. The stone tablet here hints to use the dungeon's secret order to open the door and sure enough, if we hit the four blue switches in the correct order, up, 
down, left, then right, it'll open. We'll find ourselves in this room filled with water and lily pads. There's some sculptulas on the ceiling, but if we use the beetle to cut their webs, they'll actually drop into the water and drown. Easy kill. There's some vines to climb on these two ledges, which we can use to hop down onto these lily pads to flip them over. The correct one to turn is also hinted to us by this red ruby visible in the water behind it. That's a nice touch. If we flip it over and swim down this way that we just uncovered, we'll go down this narrow passage, breaking these barricades as we do, and arrive at this ledge. Heading through the door loops us back into the previous room, but up on this balcony where we can open this chest and grab our first key. Great. Now we can use this water spout on this pipe to loop us back up to this ledge and head back into the central room. We're off to a good start so far. I like how this section loops back on itself to cut down on any uninteresting backtracking. Okay, we can spend the key we just found on that door near the entrance and enter the giant statue's interior. We'll find this vertical shaft inside and there's nowhere to go but down. So if we jump down, we'll be in this circular room at the bottom where we'll have our mid-boss fight. This pits us against a Stalfos, albeit a stronger one than the Stalfos we faced before. The battle pretty much starts out the same as what we've seen already, but after a few hits, he'll reveal that he has four arms and thus four weapons to battle with. Even so, he'll still leave at least one angle exposed to attack him, or at the very least an opening to stab through the center. Also a fun note, but if he strikes at you and you successfully shield parry, you'll disarm him, that is to say you'll briefly knock his arms completely off, giving you an opportunity to strike. Once he's defeated, this door will open and we'll find this chest with the dungeon item. It's the whip. The whip is a pretty unique item for Zelda. Its design fits the dungeon's light dark theme, with the bottom being this dark red and the top being a glowing blue. As per usual, we'll be locked in the room, needing to use the dungeon item to get out. In this case, there's these faucets, which we can use the whip to turn on, activating these water spouts. We can ascend up this room's three floors by doing this, but we'll hit the top and find the boss door. We don't have the boss key yet, so we won't be able to proceed further this way. So instead, we can take the middle door out of the central statue and back into the main room. Exploring back around this room some more, we can find this hook sticking out of the eastern wall just past the door we went in before. We can use the whip with this as basically a grapple point, and swing across the gap here. This is not unlike the grappling hook in Wind Waker, though a bit simplified. On the next ledge we'll find a chest with the dungeon map. Great. There's a room here that's gated off as well, but we'll come back to that later. If we press on a little further, we'll find at the western end of this room this lever that is out of reach. We can stand on this lily pad, use the whip to turn over the next lily pad, so we can hop to that one and use the whip to pull the lever. This shuts off the water flow from this fish statue, which reveals this entryway below it, somewhat reminiscent of the dungeon entrance itself actually. We can swim through the tunnel, and we'll come out into this western room. There's an optional chest around the back of the room here, and a sculptula to battle. The path here is gated shut, but we can actually use the whip through the bars to pull a lever on the other side and open the gates. This next room has a few baddies, but what we'll want to do is swing across the gap with the whip, over to these vines, climb around this rotating pillar, pull this lever with the whip to open this gate, then swing across this gap as well. We'll end up in this alcove at the top of the room, where we can activate this switch, which opens a whirlpool in the center of the room, so we can hop in and get flushed down. This takes us into the dungeon's basement for the first time. We can drop these sculptulas on the ceiling into the water just like before, in order to flip this lily pad and proceed. Swimming through the tunnel will seemingly hit a dead end, as there's a locked door which we don't have a key for. However, the bow Coblin on the other side of the fence here has the key that we need, so we can actually snatch it from him using the whip, and head on through the door. Thanks for the help, buddy! Down the hallway here we'll actually get a tease of where the boss key is. It's down in this pit, out of reach. That pit is actually directly below the giant Buddha statue in the main central room, so remember that for later. Next, we'll reach the end of the hallway and find this pipe, which takes us back upstairs. We'll find ourselves in the northernmost part of the dungeon, in that room behind the gate we saw when we found the map. We can actually open that gate now to go back into the main central room to make any backtracking easier. This northern room here is a pretty clever one actually. There's some lily pads in the water 
water here, and just like earlier, there's a tease with a red rupee under this one. If we climb these vines up to this ledge and leap down onto the lily pad to flip it over, then we can swim down the tunnel. We'll reach this staircase which leads up to this ledge that we couldn't reach before, and we can activate this faucet switch with the whip to turn on this water spout directly under the lily pad that we just flipped. So now we can climb back up to that ledge, use the whip to flip the lily pad back over to its original position, and cross over the gap. Next we can head down the hall and open this gate and we'll find ourselves on this balcony in the main central room. There's a new enemy type here called a Phoenix, which you can defeat by using the whip on its tail to ground it and deliver a fatal blow. From up here we have a pretty good view of the central room. If we hang a right, we'll find a series of vine walls to climb. We can climb up here to find an optional chest, and climbing further towards the western end of the room, we'll come up to this protruding section of the walkway. There's a faucet here to create a short cut back up to this ledge if you need, and this large switch is on the wall which we can reach using the whip, which causes the giant Buddha statue to move. Not unlike the moving central platform in Snowhead Temple actually, except that it's got rooms on the interior like the giant central tower in the water temple actually. We'll see the bottom door of the statue lower into the basement room where we saw the boss key earlier. We can head into the central room interior, down to the bottom of the shaft again, and we can exit out that bottom door and find our ourselves in the dark basement. Here's where we will encounter the cursed bokoblins. They're just undead bokoblins, and yeah, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. They're slow and not too hard to defeat, but if you have a sacred shield, then you can actually shield bash to momentarily give them pause and leave them vulnerable to attack. But if I'm being real, they're so slow that you really don't have to worry about it. We'll also find this pool of dark liquid, which, although never specified to be in my own headcanon, is actually malice, just like we see in Breath of the Wild. Okay, there's a path that snakes left around the back of the statue, and we'll come into this room with this huge demon sculpture. It looks really creepy with its angry face and its two bony hands sticking out of the wall like this. There's a bit of a puzzle here, but here's what to do. You can fly into its eyes with the beetle and find a gem switch which will block the flow of malice from the statue's mouth. Now we can use the beetle to grab this bomb and fly it over to destroy this rock which was blocking the path. We can cross the pool of malice across these lily pads and use the whip to swing across this gap over to the ledge that we we just unblocked. Great. Next, let's climb up the rotating pillar, climb around this second rotating pillar, and use this switch to change the direction that the pillars are all turning. Now we can safely cross here, follow along the path, climb around this third rotating pillar, turn the switch back to its original position to change the rotation direction back, then climb back around the pillar that we just came from, but the opposite way, and we'll land on this ledge, where at the end of the path, we'll find ourselves at the bottom of this pit filled with bones. Here's where that spider's thread story inspiration really comes into play. There's this single thread in the center of the room to climb up. Cursed Bokoblins will chase us up, and if one catches you, then you'll have to shake him off. This is a short section, but man, the tension runs high. It won't take long though, and we'll make it back up to the first floor. We'll be on another ledge in the main central room, and pulling this lever will extend this walkway out over to the same large switch that we activated before. We can turn it back upright to return the giant statue back to its original position, so that it's no longer blocking the chest with the boss key. Now we can slide back down the thread into the basement room, and there's a drop back into that section where the statue just was. And in this pit of bones, we'll find this chest with the blessed idol. But no time to celebrate, the statue will start sinking back down, so just ignore all the enemies and run out of there. They'll all get crushed anyways, and this gives us a shortcut back into the giant Buddha statue's interior, so we can ride these water spouts all the way back up and use the blessed idol to open the boss door. Though by boss door I actually mean it just opens up the ceiling of this interior room so we can actually take these stairs up and we'll be on the top of the giant statue. There's four of these switches to activate here and by doing so it will raise the statue to its highest position nestled right into this alcove in the ceiling. Now we can take this staircase up and head into the boss room. <laughs> Upon entering the boss room, which itself is shaped like the inside of a giant lotus flower, we'll find our old pal Girahim. He'll be annoyed at us showing up again, so he'll ditch, leaving an opponent behind for us. This golden, ancient automaton assembles itself and initiates the battle. This 
This is Coloctos. His design fits the Eastern-inspired aesthetic of this dungeon perfectly. Supposedly, Coloctos was the guardian of this place, meant to keep out intruders. Now, bit of theory time, but based on the fact that he's in pieces when we first enter, with Girahim perched on top of him, it's possible that Coloctos had actually tried to battle Girahim to drive him out of the temple, only to be defeated. But now he's been cursed by Girahim, filling him with evil energy, perhaps being the first instance of technology being corrupted by malice, not unlike the Guardians and Divine Beasts from Breath of the Wild. At least that's the impression I get here, as we see this dark purple substance within him. Now I'll be upfront, he's all well and cool looking, but gameplay wise, this is where Coloctos shines. This is my favorite boss fight in the game, and it earns that spot for just how fun it is. He'll take massive swings at you, and if you dodge correctly, his weapons will get stuck in the floor. So you can use the whip to latch onto his joints and tear his arms clean off. Oh, that's so satisfying to do. When he gears up for another strike, he'll briefly leave his weak point exposed, so you'll want to take the opportunity to strike. You may only get a couple of hits in before he reacts and protects himself again. Then repeat the process. Make sure to stay far enough away to be able to avoid his attacks, but also close enough that he'll still attempt to strike, and that you'll be close enough to duck in and hit that weak spot. After repeating this a few times, he'll change his tactics and move on to the second phase of the battle. Coloctus will tear himself free from the floor and resume the battle, but now with legs so he can pursue you. He grows a cage to protect his weak spot as well, and wields six blades. He really is trying to up the ante here, and I love it. However, the same tactic still applies. When he strikes, dodge away so his weapons get stuck in the floor, use the whip to tear his arm off, and... <laughs> disarm him. This will actually give us the opportunity to pick up one of his swords and turn it against him. Using his sword, we can hack off his legs and arms and smash apart the cage protecting his weak spot. Then go in for that weak spot to deal some damage. After a few hits, he'll reassemble himself and we can repeat the process. He may also summon in some cursed bokoblins to help him out, but they can be swatted away easily enough. They're actually weaker than the ones that we found in the basement, so they're more of a nuisance than anything else. This phase of the battle is why this is my favorite boss fight. Being able to disarm him, literally, and use his weapon against him, and just go absolutely nuts on him in an overpowered frenzy, while not being particularly difficult, is just pure fun. Nothing less than spectacle and fun. This is the kind of boss battle that's not really meant to test your skill, so much as just being an absolute blast to do, and I never get tired of it. Once he's defeated, he'll completely fall apart, we'll get our heart container, and we can head into the next room where we'll find the first of the sacred flames. This one is Faror's Flame. Bathing your sword in the flame improves it, increasing its reach, and sharpening it so you now deal double the damage. Nice. Hmm, what's that mark you got there? So that concludes the Ancient Cistern, my favorite dungeon in Skyward Sword. Looking at the map, it doesn't appear all that large or too long, but the rooms are all pretty sprawling and there's a lot to do here. The dungeon has some of my favorite themes, architecture, and music. It has a lot of ideas going on here, and a lesser game developer could have gotten all of these ideas conflated and created a mess that lacked cohesion, but they pulled it off. They crammed all of these brilliant ideas into one one deeply inspired dungeon, and did it with grace. This dungeon is a great way to usher us into the game's second act, and it's absolutely a high point of the game for me. Though I do still have a few complaints. First off, the doors share their design with Skyview Temple, and I guess it would have been nice for it to have a unique pattern of its own. Though ultimately, that's barely a complaint, and I may not have even noticed this if we didn't have to retread that dungeon for some reason right before coming here. I do sort of wish the dungeon were a bit longer, but it is still a reasonable length. I guess I just love my time here so much that it's sad when it comes to an end. I also feel like the whole dungeon secret order idea could have been better implemented. When it's first teased out to us, it sounds like it's going to be super important, but it's really just used to unlock one door and that's it. Even if there were just one more puzzle that made use of it, that could have alleviated the issue. These complaints are super minor though. My biggest gripe really just comes from how long it takes to get here, but that's all stuff that's outside of the dungeon. So, it's sort of a moot point. Overall, the Ancient Cistern is a fantastic dungeon. It does nearly everything right, and then manages to cap it off with what is in my opinion the most fun boss battle in the game. I can't sing my praises to the design of this place high enough. It's just a beautiful, serene place, and I can't help but love it. 
thank you so much for watching this video, everybody. I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me here on Patreon, in particular those who supported at the cheese tier or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, and Grey Mage. Thank you so much for the support, you guys, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye!